the Value Art Podcast. Welcome back to the Value Art Podcast. Eddie here with my <laughs> co-host Izzy. Uh, this is episode three. Today is the first day we have our co-producer Mark with us. Uh, I, like I said on the second episode, I felt like I identified with Mark's boundless curiosity i think was the terminology i used and i really do i just getting to know him and he's listening now so it's a little awkward because he's not actually speaking back to me but i know he's there listening but mark i want to say i'm really happy to have you on the team and uh i'm i'm enjoying so far working together and uh don't mess that up for me because i don't i don't want to have to replace you (laughs) just kidding mark (laughs) i also subscribe to your your newsletter and stalked you on instagram and i saw that you're a bookworm like me so i can't I really can't wait to have the chance to, you know, exchange books. Because Mark doesn't have the ability to plug himself right now, <laughs> I will do it for him. Everybody who's listening, go go check out Apocalypse Daddy, his blog. It's fantastic. It's really fun, really engaging, and uh, quite insightful in terms of, like, exactly what we're going over on, on the Value Art podcast, like learning about these new frontiers uh, with art and technology. I think I might have mentioned it on the last one. He has this really great article about the internet 3.0 and the metaverse. And I love yeah, it. it was, it's, it's great. So go check that out. Um, let's, let's get into the episode, I guess. Izzy's luckily joining us. She almost <laughs> wasn't able to make the episode because uh, where were you? You were in Greece, right? Yeah, I was in Greece and they changed like, uh, I thought I wouldn't be able to return to Italy. <laughs> Your flight was canceled. It was or? it was canceled because there was a, a a strike here in Italy, for um those who control the towers, so couldn't couldn't depart, and that's why we really need technology to not have people controlling the towers, <laughs> completely. Like I want it to be completely handled by technology. The air traffic controllers, you want? To, yeah. You want that there to be no hu- no humans. Whoa, I just want technology. A, what? <laughs> After Monday, I want you to do some research for the next episode. <laughs> tell me if that's possible and tell me if that's something that's in development now, because I don't know if I feel comfortable with and that. I, and I'll tell you if I change my idea, if it's just like me being <laughs> frustrated for what happened on Monday. Mark is saying, I agree, human error is dangerous when it comes to planes and strikes, especially strikes, Mark. <laughs> but should we get into it real quickly, like a brief t- conversation about this? Because I think it's it is maybe something we should make an episode out of, but the the idea that like we leave it up to machines to decide that the, the trolley problem you know what i mean yeah. like the k- kill one human kill five humans yeah. thing like <laughs> like like tesla's like self-driving cars deciding whether or not like mm-hmm. they should swerve out of the way of someone crossing the street or hit a pole you know like yeah. that is such a weird complicated conversation to have yeah so i kind of ex- exaggerated probably out of anger (laughs) but um so i I still want to to be there like somebody but you know i don't mind if there's like if they want to strike for a day i don't mind if artificial intelligence like takes the lead for the day i mean (laughs) Ah, okay so you're saying to fill in to fill in the gaps for the humans that don't want to perform but um, why would the why would we need humans then i mean i guess what artificial intelligence is going to help us with really is this right the error because sometimes the human can identify the error but what like artificial intelligence does that step ahead it identifies what the cause is sometimes the way we can't identify the cause it really goes down to the roots and i believe that it can also offer us solutions right because now it's more us going towards information right we need to repair something we go on the internet, we search for this. And I think with the advancement of technology, it's gonna be the information coming towards us. If my my washer is um, not working, how it is right now is that I have to call the technician, he sends out somebody, probably for something that I could have solved. So probably in the future, I'm just gonna put on my augmented glasses, call the technician, actually I'm gonna call like the bot, <laughs> and he's gonna guide me through how to repair it. And I avoided spending money for a technician. They avoided having to come out. I fully support my appliances <laughs> telling me when they need to be serviced and how. I don't know if I support my car deciding to kill me or to kill somebody else. But I you're not going to do that. Come on, you have to be positive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. For air traffic control, though, maybe it is actually a good application. I think, like, I worked at the FAA, actually, one summer as an intern. And I remember 
a tour of the of the tower and the air traffic controllers being like this is one of the most stressful jobs i think Boy, there is yes. it's like i think it, yes. an incredibly high suicide rate for for air traffic controllers it's which a lot is of like, responsibility and you're never off you're like when you're there you're never off there's no downtime you don't get to like look away and make uh your, your mistakes could kill people <laughs> so i couldn't live with that that was quite a tangent but <laughs> a nice one uh, so first, I'll start with value art news, and then we'll move into some uh, art and NFT news. But value art news, the, the, the biggest news, obviously, is our auction is live. We went live last Thursday. Spike is currently sitting at five Ethereum. As I last checked, I haven't I haven't amazing. checked in the last like hour or so. Yeah, but what's what's amazing about that is that from what I've seen of other digital auction sites and and just auctions that last a prolonged period, like a lot of the a lot of the movement happens in like the last couple hours or the last few minutes, right? It does. If we have activity, like that was one of the things we weren't exactly sure about. Mm -hmm. like, is there going to be any activity? Confirmed. People are watching. They people are. are involved. I've heard from our producers that there are quite a few wallets uh, attached to the platform. So we know that people are there with with intention. So I'm, I'm really curious to see how tomorrow goes with, with it being the last day. So. I'm expecting a lot, a lot more activity. Like towards the end, everybody like, probably I'm gonna bid too. Are you? It's already at, jeez, uh, <laughs> we've already passed my my level of <laughs> of ability to bid. Yeah. yeah, my range for investing in a piece of art uh, is quite low, but there's an interesting project that was launched last, I think last week or, mm -hmm. or at the beginning of this month. Um, Damien Hurst's the currency project, uh, which we I want to talk a little bit about that because I find it fascinating. And I actually registered for the auction. It's like you have to register with MetaMask even to be eligible to potentially buy uh, one of the pieces. But the currency is uh, a collection of ten thousand NFTs, and uh, it's unique in that the artist is giving the collectors uh, the ability to decide. Do they want the digital? Do they want the NFT? Or do they want a physical, the physical version of the work? So there's 10,000 unique works. It's Damien Hurst's like dot work, which is not super impressive, but it is unique. It wasn't printed. It was handmade. And there are 10,000 of them. So you could own a Damien Hurst original and hang it on your wall for what is going for 2,000 for the work. Mm -hmm. um, or you could decide, I would rather have the NFT. But the catch is, once you choose... The other is destroyed. So you choose the, oh, the physical, so, the digital, the digital, the NFT is burned. Or if you choose the NFT, the digital is, is destroyed. So only one can exist. And Damien Hurst is asking the collector, like, what do you, where do you place the value? What, what do you think is valuable? And I love that. I love that part of it. So wait, like he would actually destroy the physical if you choose the digital? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's, a, it's a brilliant question because it's exactly what we're talking about these days with like the value, value of digital art like mm -hmm. can you get value out of a digital piece of art something that can be replicated infinitely i've had sort of like a love-hate relationship with his work in the past and I've, I've never been like truly impressed with the execution of certain things mm -hmm. but this to me is is perfect it's it's aware it's creative it's clever it's it sort of cynical but not not at the same time and i love that i think that that's a necessary conversation to be having and he has such an immense platform to do it. So I'm, I'm really happy to share this with our with our platform. And I, I, I'm i curious what, I don't know. I'm curious, Izzy, what do you think about it? I mean, it's insane. Um, it's He's really putting you in front of on what, like, where do you stand, right? Uh, <laughs> and it's not easy because especially now when something is so new, you really have, like, you really have to be convinced. Hey, by the way, does he send you like a picture that he destroyed, like the piece of art? Like, <laughs> I I wonder. I don't know how that if it's going to be like a ceremony or something, or if you get like, um, I don't know. I, I I imagine it just sort of happens. Maybe there's a smart contract involved. Uh, I don't know. Um, NFTs right now, especially and probably for a while, are gonna are, are pure speculation. Like investing in one is is purely spe speculative in that it's going to be worth something sooner or later but here you have the choice of in investing in a physical piece still if you wanted to i wonder if that is going to be if 
if the, the fact that it had a digital counterpart that was destroyed will impact the value of the physical work. If, if we'll see a correlation between the value of the NFTs versus the physical works on a secondary market, for example. Mm-hmm. But I wonder, what do you think the, the percentage will be in terms of like who, who chooses what out of the 10,000 that are out there? Like, I think it's more a, a see- generation thing. I'll be honest. Um, <laughs> not that we're dinosaurs, but we find ourselves like, <laughs> I think we're the most confused, like not confused. Um, that it's like a hard decision for us. Gen Z wouldn't even think about it. Like they would go right for digital, right? Right for, right for the NFT. Yeah. They wouldn't even like blink an eye. This is also uh, like you have the generational thing, of course, but you also have these two worlds mm-hmm. like Damien Hurst coming from a traditional art world and crypto being such a new like techie thing that like Mm -hmm. i think a lot of the a lot of the potential investors in this i'm imagining are are gonna not be interested in it from the art side but more from the tech side the the financial side Mm -hmm. you know like the 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 crypto side and and i wonder if that if that's going to impact the the way we see this split i wonder how many of those people crypto investors are, are even interested in physical products at all or, if, or if, if it goes in that direction or if there's if there is an interest in having an nft for physical works or if digital is good enough for people i think uh at some point digital is going to be like good enough what would you choose in this case you would choose the the nft in this period i'm really into nft so i'm all about it like I, I i was talking to my boyfriend the other day like we, we talk about our future home we're already thinking about like buying like panels to put our NFTs, right? Um, so wow. <laughs> I know we're thinking like in the entrance, we want to have like our NFTs portrayed. So, and that's why like the other day when we were looking at the pictures of uh, Valley Arts space, you know, physical space, we were like, oh my gosh, like this is Into so inspiration. cool. Yes, like I need that in my house. <laughs> add, it, add it to your Pinterest board. Yes, on my Pinterest yeah. board. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but, nice. But yeah. yeah, I think I would personally choose the physical piece. I think just you saying that I have a, a, a physical. Yeah, but I was also like I, I was talking to Mark about this earlier. It would be a dumb decision for me to get the physical piece because I would probably lose it or or not take good care of it, knowing myself. Think about it. Imagine you have, like, I don't know, your own place with all your uh, paintings, like physical paintings, and then at a certain point, I don't know, like. You know what happens, like, especially now in Europe with all these, like, climate change, right? And it rains, like, really, really bad, and all your paintings get destroyed, right? That wouldn't happen. Well, <laughs> that wouldn't happen with NFTs. Cause... That's part of the value is its rarity, its scarcity, right? That's that's part of what makes NFT special is it, it allows the digital art to have that. And so I guess you're right. It's, it's a, a way of having <laughs> something super rare and super hard to replace, but not... At risk of water damage. Yeah, or fires, anything. Yeah. It's like mine forever. Yeah. Like, I feel like Gollum yeah. now. <laughs> like, with the ring. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah. yeah. So, I want to touch on a couple other items of news before we get into your newsletter. Dame Dash was sued by Rockefeller Records for selling an NFT that he didn't have the copyright to, which is interesting because we're going to talk to our guest today, Nate Harrison, about copyright and intellectual property. Uh, and Nate has has this background in uh, sort of exploring this through the realm of music. So I thought this was an interesting story to touch on now. But what was what was great about the story and the reason I think it's it's fun is because he didn't just take it down and like address it. He he took it down and instead he put his one third share of of the label on sale as an nft which i think is such a bold thing to do yeah. like but how does that work how do you how do you put one third of your shares in a, in a company on sale as an nft uh, apparently it's not actually like if you were to buy the the nft you don't actually become 33 percent owner mm-hmm. of uh rockefeller records but it's a, it's a promise for the transaction to happen at some point in the future. So it's a bit ambiguous, but I, I think that was worth bringing up for me because it just reminded me that this whole, this whole thing is so undefined still. You, you can do anything with an NFT. You can, you can bake anything into 
a smart contract. You can really design it however you want. So that's exciting. I mean, it's kind of weird in this case. Mm -hmm. I think it's more of a publicity thing than anything. But there are a lot of exciting projects coming out now that are, are not just about owning the rights to a JPEG. You know what I mean? Absolutely. No. Let's talk a little bit about smart contracts. Uh, something I'm just starting to understand. Uh, smart contracts are essentially a computer program developed by a human to execute automatically. Mm -hmm. And you can really design them to be anything. And an Oracle, like Chainlink, for example, allows you to extend the functionality of that smart contract outside of just the blockchain itself. It's essentially a third-party service that provides smart contracts more information. Remember the Terra Zero thing I sent you? Yeah. Yeah. Like the white paper on? Exactly. So Terra Zero is really cool. I think it's a great example of the potential of blockchain and, and, and smart contracts for the purpose of art, but actually for the purpose of like changing our environment and, and the world and how we view it, which I guess is kind of what art is supposed to do, right? It is. But so Terra Zero is an organization that's using blockchain to at first the white paper was about giving a forest of like a an actual forest sort of autonomy or ownership over itself and being able to distribute its assets and essentially hire humans as laborers to harvest itself and like have control over its production which i think was like insane to to conceptualize it at first i read that and i was like what a forest controlling itself amazing but more recently they created this nft called two degrees which uses smart contracts, uh, a smart contract and an oracle to destroy itself mm. if the global average temperature increases no above way. two degrees. Okay. Yeah. So it uses an oracle to read NASA's uh, evaluation of the global average. And if at some point that surpasses two degrees, the NFT will burn itself or it will it will initiate the ability for it to burn itself but a human has to confirm that that is true and it wasn't an error and then it'll yeah it'll destroy itself which it's a commentary on on how we're treating our natural resources and i think it's a great example of how art and technology can really be used to make a positive impact but what's sort of hypocritical about it is this idea that you're using a technology in ethereum mm -hmm. in a blockchain which is is in some ways harmful to the environment. Like I think is Ethereum is still proof of work, right? It's proof of work, but it's uh it's goal is to do, to become proof of a uh, stake this year. I guess it makes more sense that they would use this to to make this statement because it just seemed kind of hypocritical to me at first to do something like this to to try to save our natural resources mm -hmm. by using more energy, destroying more resources. I mean, <laughs> um... in a way that's also making the statement, it's also making the same point, I guess. But can I ask you, like, do they have a limited quantity of NFTs that they're saying they're going to destroy as they do, um, you know, receive? I believe it's just one NFT. I don't know. So there's just like one. And when are they going to be evaluating? The contract runs once a year. Okay. Awesome. But I mean, that's, that's still a, an expensive thing to run right it's still expensive to run a smart contract in an oracle like that because of the amount of nodes correct i guess they probably know the goal of ethereum to come proof of stake um and know that that will be less harmful to the environment so i'm i'm, I'm guessing that's kind of their belief this use of blockchain as as the actual media for art is so fascinating to me rather than just having a, a digital asset like actually a procedural piece of art built on blockchain that's mm -hmm. that's exciting that's something i want to explore more of next week i'll go more into the technical side of the difference between um proof of work and proof of stake so stay tuned for next time but another news that i really love this week and that i feel like a huge fomo um is in the nft and gaming industry it's axie infinity that went up 131 percent um so i've been looking a lot lately into you know play to earn games i haven't had the chance to play because i don't have time but um it's definitely something that i you know really caught my attention and said this is gonna change everything like especially for who's you know the younger 
generations right now. But like making a career out of gaming yeah. just not for like not for like through Twitch streaming or through like pay, uh like Patreon or something. You mean just like playing the game yeah. and earning a wage wages from that. How does that work? Like what are the what how is it hours? Is it like are they doing mining while they're planning? Like what no. where's the money coming so from? So the money comes from so I, I still have to play it. I'm I swear this weekend I'm gonna take some time to download it and play. <laughs> So practically you have these little fluffy, cute little things, <laughs> animals, if you can call them, they're called axes. You purchase them, you breed them, you grow them. They have also some challenges be between other axes and that's how you earn. So is it right? like crypto kitties or crypto yes, punks? Exactly. It's practically the same. It's very similar to um, crypto kitties. So you're buying, you're, you're investing you're into investing. the platform by buying the assets already. Exactly. Okay. So, so you need to, is there, is there a fee to play? Is there like a subscription to play or is it free? I'll find out this weekend. I'll let you know next week. <laughs> Your homework is to play this game this weekend and then report it, back. It next really week. is. It's like one of my primary goals, but what I, what I understood is that these SLPs, um, of course it's like an investment. I buy them and then the value grows. I earn hoping it, it really like, explodes but <laughs> i mentioned a little bit that we're having a guest on nate harrison and uh someone i'm really excited to talk to um we're going to discuss a little bit about appropriation art and uh fair use appropriation art specifically is using pre-existing objects or or iconic imagery or things from other artists to make your message clear to to make your work make sense as as an artist um it's a very gray area for art and artists, and there's been a lot of legislation, uh, litigation around it. And I think it's worth discussing because I, there there are areas where blockchain has the potential to solve ownership, provenance, which I pronounced wrong in the first episode. I said provenance, <laughs> provenance and uh, digital rights and managing digital rights, having centralized or decentralized registries for copyright, for example, with the benefits of the blockchain. So being permissionless, being distributed and transparent and uh, having no single point of failure and, and being sort of tamper resistant and peer to peer, I think seeing those aspects augmenting our existing systems like what does that look like and i i don't know if nate has any position on this but it's something that i'm interested in exploring and i imagine other people who are enthusiasts of the technology and enthusiasts of the art are are wondering so let's bring nate on and see what he has to say about some of these things cool so nate welcome to the value art podcast value art is a platform for auctioning for minting uh, auctioning nfts uh, with a focus on doing digital originals of iconic physical works of art. So creating a one-to-one -one copy of a piece of art and with the, with the help of the artist or the collector and then auctioning it on our platform and uh, pretty much extending the audience or the reach of the, of the original okay. piece. So when you say one-to-one, -one, if the painting is, say, four feet by three feet, the commensurate NFT would also be four feet by three feet? It's a, I mean, that doesn't really make any sense, I guess, because it's a digital work, but I, I think it's more about the details, uh, the, the, the resolution and it's not That's what I necessarily, mean. Yeah, you, you, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So the resolution would equ equate to one-to-one. -to -one. Um, okay. so the first, the first drop there, our first drop is a Banksy. It's a, it's, um, spike, which is this piece of, uh, rock from the West bank from the wall that. Banksy did a scavenger hunt with back in like 2004, 2003. So that's a little bit about value art. But what I'm curious okay. about is, is let's just start with an introduction. Tell us who you are. Sure. Tell us what you do and tell <laughs> us, tell us why you think I'm interested in, in talking to you today about, about this intersection of art and technology. Sure. Um, my name is Nate Harrison. I am an artist and writer. Uh, my primary sort of field of expertise has been precisely that intersection of contemporary art and United States uh, intellectual property law. And I tend to stress the U.S. part of it just because these kinds of laws, although they overlap to some degree around the world, they are particular to their own country's sets of laws. So my own particular specialty has to do specifically with the United States law, United States concepts of fair use, for example, which is not the same in other places. So yeah, I've, I've been interested in the way ways that art kind of interacts in um, with the law 
uh, yeah, for probably, probably since the Yaman Break project, actually, which was one of my first, very first projects. Um, and I was interested in that at the time, you know, as, as you might remember, from, you know, through thinking about music and copyright law. But to tell you the truth, I, I kind of got into that project not having really much knowledge about law. Um, as much as I, I had been making music, I, I was a kind of a self-taught, you know, bedroom electronic music producer and just was in that sort of community in New York City at the time that was really into breakbeat culture and, and whatnot. So I knew the story of the Amen Break only through the, you know, through the, the community that I was in, the musicians. Very little did I know about copyright law or anything like that. So it was just in doing the research about that that I kind of discovered this whole other domain of thinking about cultural production through the lens of intellectual property law. And so that became very interesting to me, actually. And I kind of, the music aspect of it, although I still love to listen to and to make a music, make music occasionally, um, that became less interesting to me than the sort of legal implications of artistic production. I ended up going and writing a PhD about it and, you know, writing things about it in various books and journals and whatnot and serving on, you know, serving on various um, copyright cases and, um, and whatnot. So yeah, that's just kind of in my interest. Um, and then, and then I kind of shifted focus from music more into visual art because that at the time, this is maybe about 10 or 12 years ago, there really wasn't that much writing about visual art and the, the kind of the, the entanglements of intellectual property law at that time. Now there's much more, but yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So, um, was your, was your interest in pursuing visual arts motivated by the, the law side of it? Or, or um, the... Well, I went to art school for my master's degree. I went to Cal arts out in California and that's actually, I was really lucky. That's a really great school. If only because, it blends a lot of students together. It kind of puts lots of, you know, students with lots of different interests into kind of one boiling pot. Um, so I was, I actually applied to and was accepted into that school, into the music school. Oh, wow. Um, and when I got there, though, I discovered that the conversations that were being had in the music school, although they were kind of fascinating on some level, they weren't, they just were, didn't really speak to me. Whereas, weirdly, the conversations that were happening in the art part of the school were super fascinating to me. And so um, I started thinking about sound and music through the lens, I guess, of visual art. And I just kind of slowly but surely got more and more into the conversation about visual art. Um, then I made the, the I'm in break piece, and that kind of exposed me to intellectual property law. So then I asked myself, what if I started thinking about visual art through uh, IP law? And so, again, I decided that I wasn't done with this project yet, and I actually wanted to write a lot more about it. And so I went and did a Ph.D. and kind of really just immersed myself purely in the kind of visual art and, and IP law side of things. So re when I reached out to you, I was curious about discussing the some overlap, some parallels between the golden age of sampling and what I'm seeing now in the digital art space in terms of authorship and ownership and how complicated that world is. So if like... I know you don't I don't want to spend too much time talking about the specifics of the sampling era and, and, and that transition. But tell me a little bit about what you learned and what surprised you then and what you took into your uh, your endeavors as a visual artist. Um, hmm, that's a good question. I, I guess I would say that that culture always kind of leads the way. Cultural production always leads the way. Artistic production always leads the way. Um, the law is always behind. It is always responding to a situation. It is never proactively creating a situation. And it's tried to switch those roles. It has been, the law has always tried to go from being a reactive sort of mechanism to a proactive mechanism. And it mostly fails in that regard, just because the, the sort of the wheels of the, you know, the cogs of the machine can only move so fast. The legal system is notoriously slow and legislation and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But there have been attempts, especially with the explosion of digital culture, over the last 20 plus years of the law trying to catch up with that with like the DMCA and um, uh, you know, the algorithms that YouTube and other platforms produce to shut down like preemptively strike preemptively take down works, right? It used to be the case that the only way you get sued for copyright infringement, or usually the only way you get sued was for you to commit some sort of alleged infringement. And then the person that feels infringed comes after you. 
right? Actively, yeah. But with the yeah, so with the digital in the digital realm in 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 the, in the contemporary moment over the last ten or twenty years, there's been an increasing desire on the part of platforms and whatnot, YouTube, etc., to take the proactive step to make you know to make algorithms such that you can't even infringe or, or even run the risk of infringing. Even if you don't think you're infringing, they don't even give you the option. They don't even give you the opportunity to maybe or maybe not, you know, infringe. So that's an example of the kind of the proactive side of things that I'm, I'm explaining. You mentioned content ID basically, right? And content yeah, ID yep. works, works because you, you can, you can easily categorize and, and, and archive a, a piece of music in a way like there it's a, it's very easy to identify characteristics of a piece of music but i think it's much more complicated for visual works um to to say like this has been stolen from me or this is my work originally and i deserve credit or you should stop using it um do you know anything do you can you tell us anything that you've encountered recently that is that's trying to uh, address those concerns like a content id but for other medias i don't actually that's a great question because um yeah, and I mean, to your point, that you'd have to essentially have an original work of art photographed or you know reproduced in a certain way at a certain resolution, such that it lines up. I mean, that's that's I mean because it's really interesting what you're pointing out because an original work of art is precisely that it's an original, and it exists first and foremost usually in the analog domain, right? Like let's say a painting on a wall, versus music. Music is already electronic. Right, music is already a digital product, whether it's a CD, old school technology, or MP3s, or what have you, or streaming. It already exists as it only exists, in, as a matter of fact, pretty much as a as a digital file, right? So it is much easier to align, say, do a do an algorithmic sort of analysis of an MP3 file, and then do an A B comparison between that and some other thing that you think might be infringing. Um, but to your point, you know that's that is difficult to do with visual art. If you have a painting on a wall. You photograph. I mean, maybe they could come close, um, but it certainly would be less than perfect. And I can't think of any. I mean, usually the examples that I see with regard to so-called machine learning or AI or or, or just the, you know studying images and, and detecting their patterns and whatnot really doesn't have much to do with copyright infringement. Although I guess that could be an application. It's just as much to do with surveillance. And, um, and and actually creating entire new artworks or new images. I'm sure you have both seen those websites or I think on Vice where they like make people that are, don't even exist, right? Yeah, Out of this person does not learning. exist. Yeah, yeah it's really yeah. creepy, actually. Those ex those are exciting to me for sure. But I, I'm really I want to try to imagine how these technologies are supposed to address the concerns of copyright and and of licensing and and just in general. How do you feel about about copyright and about trying to inhibit copying and reproduction and appropriating other other artists' works. Personally, as an artist, how do you feel about it? Yeah, um, I, I would say that my own thoughts on these have developed over time and that I have become ever so slightly more conservative as I've gotten older or as I've gotten okay. th thinking about this more and more, which is to say maybe 10 or 15 years ago, I would have been much more copy left than I am now. I, I still am fairly copy left. I still believe in sort of freedom of speech and the ability for artists to sort of mostly do what they want to do with the images that they find in the world. But I will say, I also do believe in copyright. I do believe in the principle of copyright. I think it should be, uh, I think it should just be a, um, a practical um, context dependent sort of system. Part of the reason of this kind of conservatism that I'm talking about is so much of what I've researched and written about has to do with when uh, visual artists um, appropriate photographs from most often commercial photographers. Mm -hmm. and, and those commercial photographers do depend on the selling and licensing of their photographs to make a living. Do you want to talk about the, the, the Warhol Foundation versus Goldsmith case recently, the, the, yeah. how that was overturned? Do you, what is your opinion on – actually, for, for our listeners' sake, tell us a little bit of background about that because there was a decision in 2019 by the 9th District and then there was an overturning recently. So what, what happened there? Yeah, so that is probably the latest example of this kind of battle between what I'm going to call the uh, commercial photography world and the contemporary art world. 
Um, Richard Prince still has his case uh, sort of brewing right now in the court system here in New York City. And that Warhol decision probably is sending a signal to Prince and his lawyers that like things may not turn out well for him. Um, but yeah, in that case, I believe if I remember correctly, I forget what magazine was it, Rolling Stone or Vogue or Vanity some, Fair. Vanity Fair. Yeah. Um, they commissioned uh, a photographer to take a bunch of pictures of Prince, the artist Prince, not to be confused with Richard Prince, but the musician formerly known as Prince, um, and took a bunch of pictures of him. And then they uh, also commissioned Andy Warhol to do one of his kind of signature portraits. We've all seen versions of these, whether it's Marilyn Monroe or uh, Chairman Mao or whatever it is, these kind of, you know, glittery, neon, expressive, sort of flat, high contrast portraits, you know, because they commissioned both of these things, they thought everything was kind of on the up and up. Um, but, and then Warhol did make a portrait based on one of the photographs of Prince, but it turns out that he actually made a whole series of paintings based on that portrait. And the photographer never really understood that whole mechanism, that whole process. And so, you know, the original photographer got paid for doing the photography, all well and good. Andy Warhol presumably got paid for making the painting, which then appeared, I believe, on the cover of Vanity Fair, all well and good. But then the rest of those paintings, the rest of the series eventually found its way into the art market, which, you know, Warhol being Warhol probably sold for lots of money. And the photographer did not give permission for the just the general use of her photographs, um, to, you know, for, to be exploited like that. And so I believe, you know, sued the Warhol Foundation for copyright infringement, and I believe that the um, courts initially did find that 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 print the prince that Warhol uh, was operating under fair use did grant the fair use exception. But then on the appeal, the appellate court overturned that and said that those did not that the paintings did not constitute fair use and that yeah. they were liable. Hey, they didn't say it was a copy or it was plagiarized, but they didn't not say it either. Like it was the the language that they used was was very much like. It was like very politically correct way of saying like mm -hmm. we, this is this was stolen without saying it directly I think which is mm -hmm. to me really scary for for pop art and and to, for just artists in general because I'm I'm in the the copy left camp I think where I'm like mm -hmm. do do what you will with my work but mm -hmm. there's all there's obviously uh, an element of that that I don't like I don't want to see a corporation stealing from a, a small artist and taking advantage of their work but I do want to see small artists being able to take what they can from the world and make new things out of it. So it leads to the I question about there. transformation, which is the biggest topic of, of, of contention, I think, around this, which is uh, talk a little bit about the first and the fourth or the second and the fourth factors of, of fair use. And I think you you met Judge Laval, right? I think you, you mentioned I did. Him. Weirdly enough, at a party, I met him it's completely yeah. randomly. And Judge Laval is responsible for essentially the 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 way we in interpret fair use now, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so as your has your opinion over you said you mentioned you become a little bit more conservative, which surprises me actually because I I read it I read some of what you were writing in 2013 and 2015 as kind of conservative personally, but I'm curious <laughs> if that's changed at all for you in the last like two to three years at all in terms of fair use. Not really, actually, it hasn't really changed. I mean, I, I mean, I think that conservatism comes from again. Sort of. I mean, I, I think w what you just pointed out a second ago is really important and where you, you said something like you don't want corporations inhibiting like the little guy or whatever it is. I, I too do believe in this idea of being able to punch up in a sense, but sort of not punching down. Yeah. Right. And so I see a lot of the times I'll take Richard Prince as an example, but maybe the Warhol Foundation, too, um, not necessarily corporations, but super successful, you know, financially, you know, monetarily very wealthy um, artists, contemporary artists who's, whose work sell in the millions of dollars, essentially taking from uh, commercial photographers who are not in that realm at all, uh, you know, sort of in, 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 again, sort of win their, their, you know, make their money by the selling and licensing of their photographs. Um, as that kind of punching down. I, and I could see, I would be more sympathetic, I think, if it was, you know, an artist uh, taking from like a corporation or some, you know, like well-known images or something like that, but to kind of purloin 
images from like a, the little guy and by the little guy, I mean like a freelance commercial photographer, because the thing is, is even those photographers, like the one in the Warhol case or the one in the Richard Prince case, they're, they're fairly successful commercial photographers. I mean, they're not, they Definitely. don't operate at the level of like making tens of millions of dollars the way that, you know, Prince or Warhol might have done that, but they, they do okay. But what the problem is, is if you set a precedent for the allowance of these kinds of things, and that essentially opens the floodgates for any artist to take anything from anybody at any time. And it really does, I think, in the long term, have the runs the risk of kind of screwing over the little, little, uh, you know, photographer. Why do you why do you believe that is? Because it, it feels to me like uh, if even just getting involved in a litigation, like it, it feels like a huge burden on smaller artists to, to have to be aware and knowledgeable about this from the beginning. Yep. If they're going to go and use someone's work, they have to know what that means long term. And that to me, isn't the point of making the art in the first place, right? I think it's about communicating something that doesn't have a vocabulary for it already. So we should be able to take the visuals that help us communicate that message and to have to then learn the, the, Legal ease, I guess, is is counterintuitive or counterproductive. I guess. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I'd mildly debate that. I, I'm, I'm, I think that artists, if they are to be given sort of a great uh, deal of freedom, should also be given or tasked with, I guess, a great deal of responsibility. And I don't think actually it's that much of a stretch for artists to learn what fair use is and what the four fair use factors are. In fact, the College Art Association makes a Fair Use Best Practices Guide precisely for artists. It's like 20 pages long. It could You could read it in 20 minutes. Uh, so just to kind of, kind of familiarize yourself with that, um, or you know, for the artists to familiarize themselves with that, at the end of the day, I think that this comes down mostly to artistic intention. And, right. and I think that part of the sticking point in both the Prince case and in the Warhol, the recent Warhol case, is that it's unclear what the artistic intention is and you know prince especially and warhol too are known for kind of stylizing photographs which is to say kind of transforming them on a, in a certain way yeah. but but it you know you have to really pull teeth to get them to explain what their intention is or their rationale is or the, in other words the, the justification for what they why they're doing what they're doing so, and you you believe that it is a requirement to have to explain that as an artist, you should have to, you should have to explain your intention for creating the piece. I think so. And maybe that is the, the true kind of conservatism re being revealed, because I know that that is, is kind of a traditional way of thinking about understanding art. But I do think that that is, I don't, yeah, I, the, the idea that you shouldn't have to explain yourself, um, especially in a court of law. Um, I just don't think that flies. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't it logically. What doesn't make any sense to you because you need to, you need to have data. You need to understand. You need to yeah. make informed I mean, decisions. If, I don't know if you had the chance or ever were interested in, in reading the the depositions and the in all of the court testimony in in the in the Richard Prince case. I mean, if you read it, it's kind of amazing because he is asked, you know, point blank, what do these mean? How are you justifying these? What is your artistic intention? And his answer is, I don't really have an intention. I just like to make cool stuff. That's all. In my art, I mean, in my painting, my paintings are cool because I'm Richard Prince. And yeah, and, and that doesn't uh, help. That just doesn't fly. Yeah, it doesn't help. It doesn't, it doesn't help. help and it, but it also doesn't like it, it makes it, it the reason I'm worried about it is because if I as an artist want to just pursue an impulse an an artistic impulse without really understanding the intention yet, but but just going with the intuitive nature of creating Mm -hmm. that could really get you in a lot of trouble down the line, especially if you make something sort of groundbreaking for yourself or for your audience or whatever. I think you then need to retroactively decide what the intention was or retrospectively. That seems weird, right? And you could always change that later weird. on. It does seem weird. And, and you bring up, you bring up something that's a great point And also that courts have actually also identified, which is, you know, the, 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 or the, 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 the legal, you know, lawyers have, in other words, they'll say this whole argument judge, of artists needing to have intention isn't that going to you know do it do what you just said right which is artists will just make something and then post facto or whatever uh yeah put, yeah, up, put some sort of like explanation behind it right yeah i mean it's yeah. funny because richard prince was sued i don't know six or eight years ago for all of these you know rasta images that he pilfered from a book about you know a, a photographic book of uh you know jamaicans and 
he again in that case he just you know i just kind of liked the way they looked i just kind of thought it was cool i didn't really care you know i just thought it was cool it's funny because if um if he would have said something like in this i'm not, I'm not going to pull from like the jargon of you know contemporary art school education if he would have pulled something out like oh well this is my critique of kind of post-colonialism and i'm seeking to decenter the subject of you know white privilege you know if he would have kind of couched it in sort of like art speak i sh i'm i'm sure it would have gotten you know much a very you know, different response sensitive. yeah 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 um so I, I do want to talk a little bit now about appropriation and, and like your opinion of what qualifies as transformative enough or, or intentional enough. Uh, and I want to ask you a, about a couple examples. So one, um, do, are you familiar with the uh, after Sherry Levine dot com? Uh, I think that's um, I am familiar with it. And I believe that's. Um michael manenberg's site no yeah yeah it is and it's a it's a and see, I actually went, i actually went to school with michael oh cool although he he graduated right before i did so i i know i know michael yeah yep it's a really great early example of the the ambiguity ambiguity and the blurred lines of of authorship right i mean it's a it's a website that will print out a certification of a photo of a photo that you can own right I think that's a brilliant commentary on what is authorship and what is transformative. And I'm, I, I, we're seeing things now like you have, well, you had tokenized tweets, a Twitter account that would essentially tokenize any tweet that you commented on below it and create an NFT out of it that you can then buy and, and own, uh, which mm -hmm. we later discover was actually just ownership of the URL that hosted the tweet, which is a weird thing. But we're seeing a lot of people sort of capitalizing on a moment here to take art or to make things and to to assign ownership to it. And I, I want to I wanna know if you have any position on how blockchain or how NFTs are, are impacting fair use, are impacting specifically um, the sec, uh, section 107 of the copyright. Like, I, I, do you see anything changing right now or in the near future uh, because of these technologies, because of these new systems? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely have some thoughts on NFTs. I, um, but they actually don't have that much to do with copyright I, because I think that actually the, the, the same considerations still apply, which is this sort of transformative test. Right. Right. Um, I mean, I guess you can look at the notion of transformative and maybe we should from a few different ways. But before we do that, you know, I wonder if it would behoove, you know, the, the audience or whatever, just to just to maybe talk a little bit about like what do we mean by transformative. Right. As you as you noted yeah. a few minutes ago, Judge Laval wrote this essay in the Harvard Law Review in 1990 called Toward a Fair Use Standard. And it was in that um, text that he introduces this notion of transformative fair use. Right. Um, so fair use. F first of all, we should just make very clear that fair use is this concept wherein the law recognizes that in some instances, artists, authors, musicians, what have you, cultural producers in general, necessarily will have to copy some part of a pre-existing work of art or a pre-existing song or pre-existing, you know, cultural expression in order to realize their own expression. Right. And that the law should not be so inflexible as to prohibit such things. And in fact, the law should instead be flexible enough to let artists kind of, you know, you know, uh, copy things when they when when it behooves sort of the, the, the public good in a sense. So we should not make a law that says you can't copy, but we shouldn't make a law that says you can copy anything. Instead, what fair use says, you know, in general, you probably shouldn't copy, but there may be some circumstances where copyright or sorry, copying is allowable because in the specific context and here's why right now that becomes a huge question. What is, what are the circumstances under which copying is permissible? And this idea of fair use uh, and transformative fair use specifically is that if the secondary expression, the appropriating expression is somehow transformative of the original expression, Right. If you take a photograph of Prince, which was a, you know, I believe it was a black and white photograph, um, fairly um, wide, you know, wide ranging in its gray scales. It was a fairly continuous tone photograph. And then you enlarge it, you, you know, blow out, you know, make it very high contrast. You add some colors to it. 
does that constitute a transformation, right? We might say, yes, maybe that's a formal transformation, right? We take one thing that looks like this and we can still see the resemblance in the second thing, but it is also noticeably different, right? Um, the courts in this case said that's not transformative because the second notion or the second way of thinking about transform transformative fair use is that by taking something, I think Michael Mandelberg's website actually is a good example, even though he's really not changing the formal aspects of the Sherry Levine photographs all that much. He's changing the way you think about these kinds of things, right? That's so, it's so kind of subjective. Like it's, it's, it's super, super subjective. And honestly, I don't know that it, that would fly in a court of law, but right. I, as an artist, do believe that that is a kind of a transformative fair use. So this gets into, I mean, you're pointing to something which is, the, the, it's super subjective. All of this stuff is very, very subjective. Yeah. It's super, it couldn't be any more gray. And it couldn't yeah. be any more um, example specific. I mean, you really can't make generalizations about what constitutes transformative fair use or not, because it just has to be done on a case by case basis. What happens in the case of, or like, why why is it more uh, acceptable for someone to write about a song in a book and to reference the, even the lyrics of the song in the book, or maybe not to reference the lyrics, but to just to mention that the song was playing, and that's okay, but actually using the song in your short film or in your video is not okay. Do you have any idea why that's like, why that passes and the other doesn't like, I think I was reading a Murakami book and he mentions, he mentioned like a queen song, I think. And, and the feeling that it evoked in him and like a certain part of the song. And I was like, that's just like putting it in your film. I know the song. I know the lyrics. I'm hearing it in my head right now and that's okay, <laughs> but it's not okay for me to use the, the song itself. Yeah, I, I don't have a great answer for that other than to say for hundreds of years, scholars have been writing things uh, and, and citing other scholars' work. Um, so, you know, and I'm sure you both know this very well. When you read a, like an academic book off of a university press, um, you know, you're not considered a serious scholar if you don't reference other scholarly works. So you almost have to sample, in a sense, other scholarly works, right? So your book just won't be taken seriously unless it has footnotes and, and you go seek the, oh, they got that idea from this book and what have you, here's your bibliography. Because um, it, it, it sends the message like you did your homework, right? You really know this. You're really an expert. So that that is a long-standing tradition that, that you know, we, when, a, when an author writes a book, they don't, you know, go contact the, the, you know, the presses that produced the 250 books that they cited in their own book to get permission to like, you know, quote, such and such said this in this book, they just do it. That's just understood. It's the, it's the, it's the act of sharing knowledge, which again, is part of the general mission of higher education. Right. Um, so, so to me, your question is why don't we do that? Like in other sort of domains of culture, right? If you make a song and you, um, you know, include some snippet of a song into your song. Well, you know, why is that a why is that a problem? But the other, the book thing is not, or vice versa, right? Think about it from the other way. Um, I don't have a good answer for that, other than to say that song is um, ostensibly the original song. Let's say is ostensibly already a product. It's already a kind of an it's already a commodity in a sense. And so we're again, this kind of gets reduced to, um, you know economics, right? If the, if, the, if the original song is already a commodity, even if you, I mean, I, I think it's stupid. I, I think you should absolutely be able to sample and include and, and recontextualize, uh, uh, you know, a drum beat or a guitar riff or what have you. Um, but since the original song already started out as a nice little packaged, you know, cultural commodity, um, I think that's where the difference is. Whereas in, at least in academia, um, you know, no, no academic writes books to make money. They write books to, you know, if you if you make like five thousand dollars from royalties from a, a university press book, you as a professor you're doing pretty good, right? So just the the money thing is just such a so far away in the conversation. It really is about sort of knowledge sharing, whereas I think the money and the in the market factors are so upfront in places like music sampling or you know including a snippet of a of a movie in your movie or or whatnot. So yeah, yeah. And I guess that's definitely a different, uh, it's not infringing, I guess, on any of the market potential of that song at all. So yeah, I, I mean, a... with your Murakami example, you know, nobody, nobody walks into, uh, you know, a music store or a bookstore 
and in a state of confusion, like walks out with a Murakami <laughs> book thinking that they bought a Queen song, right? Oh, this isn't, oh, what have I done? Right, yeah. what am I, I, bought, I went in here to buy the Queen song and somehow I came out with this Murakami book. I, I'm confused because I thought they were the same thing. Like nobody confuses them, right? Yeah, yeah. Whereas, whereas it gets very blurry when we start talking about, you know, a song that's made up of samples and how long is the sample and how much does it recontextualize the overall song and, and, and I think that all of that's very debatable. But the, again, the record companies, because they're interested in making money, are just going to try to shut that conversation down and just say all sampling is de facto yeah. infringement. In fact, yeah. we're going to build an algorithm to preclude that or to foreclose even the possibility of that, right? Yeah. Do you, do you imagine that that changes or that technology will ever have an influence over that? Actually, I was reading today about uh, the ISCC, which is this platform for... It, essentially creating DNA for digital, all kinds of digital work, like it, mm. not even just visual stuff, but but basically how I imagine it, and I'm not, don't quote me on this, I don't know if this is actually true, but how I imagine it is it just creating such a big database of different kinds of visual works that using machine learning, they can deduce what kind of work it is and what, what other works are like it. Like the same way you like say, is this a picture of a cat? No, yes, no. Like then they, mm-hmm. the machine kind of knows what yeah, a picture of a cat down. is. Yeah, yeah. So I think we're we're seeing technologies emerge that are attempting to give visual works DNA. So do you imagine that if this were to be the case, we could sort of cut out the need to to have the human element be part of it? Yeah, yeah. Or is that a possibility in your head in the future, or is that something that we're always going to be dealing with? Um, I I hope there's still some human element involved. I mean, I, I, I it makes me very uncomfortable this idea that humans <laughs> decide what because right. that's just that's just like not that far away from terminator in my opinion right, right? yeah um yeah but I, I i i mean i do think that there will be novel ways to reassess the notion of formal transformation of conceptual transformation of making things uh to change the context of things i will also say this you know e- even as i said a few minutes ago that the law is always ca- trying to in a sense play catch up um if you, I mean, and I'm going to speak specifically about the United States right now. If you think about who actually are, who, what comprises the judiciary in the United States right now, mostly old white men. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, there there are probably a handful of people of color, or you know, women, or a combination thereof, or you know, there are other shades in that spectrum. But if we're honest with ourselves, it's kind of mostly old white men, and it's not only old white men; it's more particularly like, you know, people who did not grow up in the context of, of, you know, the social media sort of, you know, world that we now inhabit. Yeah. Right. So even just, even, there is already kind of an old fashioned kind of way of thinking about these already built into the law. And, and, and the reason why I'm saying this is because that will change. There are people in law schools right now and even, you know, or, or clerking, you know, being assistants or clerking for judges right now that were that are in their late 20s or early 30s and who've who've always you know have been part of facebook and social media and instagram just as you and i have um and who who will have this just kind of like built-in innate sort of more maybe accommodating yeah. understanding yeah. Of, of the nature of copying and the reality of copying and those people will become judges and you know people who will comprise the judiciary at some point so i do think that this will shift over time I and mean, i always find it incredible when you read the final opinions of, say, the Warhol case and whatnot, you know, these are people who did not grow up in the social media milieu that we find ourselves in. But they're also not people that are in the art world or understand art from a conceptual or philosophical perspective. Most of them, I would imagine, like a judge trying to understand the intention of a work is much different than a collector or, or a fan trying to understand an artist's intention or work, right? Yeah, they're, 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 very, they're very intelligent people, but they're not specialists in the, in the world of art. And, and, and I would say that, you yeah, know, this is maybe this is where I'm kind of torn because there's part of me that thinks like, yeah, they should know about how art works. And there's also part of me that says it's precisely their lack of knowledge that provides that kind of, you know, at least attempt at a kind of an objectivity and a fairness or a neutrality or something like but, that. But then in that case, you might as well just entrust it to the machine learning algorithm. It's like, why? how is it, if it's supposed to be sort of detached and unbiased or, or ignorant in a way. Oh, the then... reason, oh, the reason why we don't is because, and, and, I'm, and I'm sorry, I can't pull from anything, you know, other than like corny, you know, Hollywood references or something is because over and over again, we are, you know, given sort of dysto- dystopian 
future scenarios where machines have kind of made taken over decision making processes. I mean, I'm thinking of the movie War Games. You see that like 80s yeah. film with Matthew yeah, Broderick. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. like we, we get the machine to decide when to do nuclear war, take the human element out of it. That that narrative of like, let the machine do it always gets us yeah. into trouble. Um, you know, there's some there's a kind of an imperfection with the human decision making process that I think actually reminds us precisely that we are human, even if things don't go your way. Um, yeah. yeah. So. What is your opinion on the U.S.'s influence over fair use and copyright and the global conversation uh, for art like because i think the copyright law in the states has is is heavily referenced and heavily discussed in in all international art communities as well um i as far as my research has shown me that the united states is intellectual property law sort of regime i guess um, is fairly dominant. It is the one that most countries sort of, in a sense, model their own laws after. Yeah. Um, but I will say that while the United States copyright law, for example, is far from perfect and is in need of overhaul, and it's getting that overhaul, I think, actually, um, it actually is, is surprisingly, I think, lenient. I mean, even that there, that there is even a fair use clause built into the United States copyright law already says something. Yeah. Right? yeah the reason um, I ask that, the reason I ask that is because if we're, if things are going to be decentralizing more and more, and if we have a decentralized registry for copyright or for content, uh, do you think that that influence is still going to extend into the creation of those platforms? Do you think that it makes sense to, to do that? Or would it be better to start fresh or to reimagine the way these things work? Oof. That's a tough one because I think that technology, you know, again, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the law is always trying to play catch up. And I feel right. like like it's just getting farther and farther. I think technology is just moving so fast that, that you know, I'm, I'm just thinking of like the average age of a United States senator or congressperson. And, <laughs> you know, just this their thinking of the world and how fast even just as you said, even within like the last five or 10 years and the whole notion of NFTs and where will we be in 10 years from now? Technology is just so, I think, overwhelming the law um, that it's, you know, sometimes I do think that all of these kind of academic discussions about copyright are almost superfluous insofar yeah. as like that. It, that's just like, you know, I will say this, one of the arguments that the copy left 20 years ago was that, oh my gosh, copyright laws are so draconian they're inhibiting our capacity to freely express ourselves. Everything's being locked down. Oh my gosh, the sky is falling. I don't know about you, but I see so much copying everywhere all the time. Appropriation all the time. People sharing and streaming and copying and duplicating and remixing. And I just I just simply don't buy the argument that, that we're being stifled creatively. I think we're actually in the most sort of creative um, time in, in the history of the human race, maybe right now. So, um, yeah, yeah. And I think I, it's only become more so and more as it becomes, as you say, as it becomes more decentralized and um, that sort of you know, laws that nation states make will have some impact, but, um, and you know, will continue to have an impact, but yeah, I just I do, don't see that any kind of, yeah. I, I agree that we have the ability, an ability now like never before to copy and remix but that's why sort of i reached out in the beginning because i think this is that golden age for copying and and re remixing and appropriating but i i think it's going in the direction of being like with the in introduction of content id youtube mm -hmm. completely changed after that the whole landscape of content changed after content id was introduced and creators are constantly having to battle copyright strikes and and having to defend themselves and and i think what would the platform look like now if that wasn't the case? Obviously, there wouldn't be as much incentive for advertisers, but it also would be a much more, I think, a much more creative place, in my opinion. Some of the content yeah, that I love yeah. the most is, is like, I love commentary channels. I love, uh, I love video essays. I love the, these kinds of channels that need to use other work, and they're getting the ability to use it, but it's also still got this barrier uh, yeah, they still of have to jump frustration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I hear you on that. I, symp I sympathize with that. Um, yeah. Um, it's funny though because I, 
have made, I mean, this just to give you a corny example, I have an Instagram account like, like many people, and I have on occasion made films of my daughter and put like a, a, a pop soundtrack behind it, like an 80s song behind it. And I will occasionally, in fact, like this guy one the other day, I got a little notice from Instagram saying that they're making my, my work inaccessible, video blocked, but then if I review it, I review what it actually says. It says something like, your video has been blocked um, except in the following countries. And then it goes on to list like 50 countries, including the United States, including Mexico, including most of the EU. And so I'm like, I don't even know what this means. And I mean, I kind of do know what it means, I guess, but I, it just seems so irrelevant and I don't care. And it seems like the people yesterday who could see my video can still see my video today. And, and then I even got one of these messages that said, after review, we're lifting the block. I didn't even submit an appeal. I didn't, and, and I didn't even try to contest it. Like I took some, you know, that song from, from the eighties, I forget the band it was called forever young. I want to be yeah. forever. Anyway. Corny loved it. I was, I was you know, 13 years old and that came out, loved it, roller skated to that, etc. <laughs> but I didn't even contest it. Yeah, I totally took that song. It's nostalgic for me. And then they, they put it back. So so first I get a message that they blocked my video, and then I got a message that they unblocked my video, and then they can and then, so I'm like, I don't even I just don't I don't know where I'm going with this other than to say that that we're just we're still sharing. There's still maybe there are some hoops to jump and whatnot, but I just I just um where does that make sense for you in that in this case? Like, where does that little intervention make sense? Is it for a, a bigger creator or a corporation or just not necessary on Instagram? Forget about it. Do you think it just needs to mature the technology? I think, I think for personal uses are completely innocuous and that should be allowed. And, and right. I think that that's the majority of these cases. And that is one of the frustrating things. I mean, yeah. Um, but again, I got unblocked after yeah. I didn't even do any. So I don't I you know, I, I just don't see. um yeah, it's you know. not really that useful. <laughs> At least yeah. it's not it's not really that intuitive or that clever. But yeah. that's the core that that's the punching down thing that I where I where I part ways with my sort of otherwise conservative thinking is is that that whole punching down thing. Somebody like BMI or or you know Capitol Records trying to go after a soccer mom or me or somebody, yeah. you know, for for some completely, you know, a 30 second clip on Instagram for my family, you know, that's ridiculous. I wonder if there's going to be a point in the future where there are accounts that are allowed to do that kind of posting and then designated accounts. I think there's also been this question recently of like celebrities have to verify themselves on social media, right? They have to say like, I am this oh, person really? okay. and I, okay. and I, I post and this is, these are my thoughts and opinions, but other people like regular people don't have to do that. And it's, it is kind of strange. And I, I think that there's obviously a lot of good how, in that. How rich or famous does one have to be before one gets yeah. to get verified? Well, yeah, where is the threshold? Where does your brand matter enough that you need to be like, I'm that person? Or do we decide like everybody needs to be verified in the same way that you carry around a driver's license? or you have, So that way you're sort of accountable, but we can decide what kind of restrictions to place on you, what kind of... Uh, of content you're allowed to share that right. that seems a bit strange too actually it sounds really really dystopian and kind of scary <laughs> i don't i don't disagree well so you have a seven-year-old is, is she exploring any games or technologies that have that you've kind of been intrigued by in terms of like the the art of it the the um the assets that like do did those worlds interest you at all? Are you are you aware of what's going on there? I am. Well, at the very least, I'm very, very conscious of the degree with which my seven-year-old is extremely digitally savvy. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm sure you've heard the term digital native. It's really incredible how adept she is at navigating a phone, at navigating a tablet, at navigating a computer. She, she, I know there's one silly example. She loves Legos. Natalia loves Legos. And she actually has a little Lego app on her phone, which lets users take pictures of their Lego creations and then post them. It's kind of like a, I can't talk right now. It's kind of like a, it's kind of like a, you know, it's like a Facebook for seven year old Lego enthusiasts. But she's like in the bed this morning looking at it going, oh, that's a cool post. Ooh, somebody posted this. Like, I'm like, you're seven. How do you know about like posting and liking pictures that other seven year olds are doing? So she's already getting ensconced into that world. And, and I'm very, um, there's, there's a part of me that's a little concerned about that. What exa what are you concerned about exactly? Like what, what about that, uh, worries you? 
Um, just at that, you know, the slippery slope into, um, you know, you know, the representation of yourself online and particularly I have a daughter. So it's like how young girls and young women represent themselves online. And just, you know, I mean, I see my, I saw my daughter a few years ago before she even really knew how to do this stuff, holding my phone without my phone even being on just like a black brick, like it is now. And sort of like posing, like selfie posing, like, like going through the motions of selfie posing without actually even taking a selfie just like and there's that that sort of naturalizing tendency to just grow just automatically in the, in the world of the image um and so that's a, just a little bit like ah, you know she's seven she's seven you know what happens when she's 17 yeah my last question anything that you've seen in the technology space where it, it relates to art that you're excited about that maybe we haven't talked about a, a, a software a service um just some news that you want to share that our audience might be interested in yeah the only thing i would say is i'm really i i actually don't go to the movies that i I'm certainly not during the pandemic but even before the pandemic just the nature of being um single father just didn't really get out to the movies as much as I might have used to years ago. And so, but I do like to try to keep up with the state of the art in terms of like where computer generated imagery is. And I'm just continue to be amazed at the level of um, sort of realism um, that is happening in computer generated imagery. And the last probably version I saw, and it's probably even better than this, was just from a few years ago in the, the, the Blade Runner remake, or not remake, but the Blade Runner 2049, where they redid Sean Young. Like they, com- they made a completely CGI Sean Young because Sean Young is whatever, 60 years old now. Um, and so Harrison Ford meets a computer generated Sean Young and how real that looked. And at, at the same time, that kind of uncanny valley of like it just looked oddly, slightly off, but that just continues to be worked on. And so I think that's that's something that just continues to fascinate me is like, where is the technology going in terms of rendering at what point will we, what we need actors anymore? Because we can just like make them. This is, I mean, it's not, not to harken back to copyright and IP, but like, what does it mean for actors when someone can deep fake their entire role into a film? What yeah. Does that mean? Yeah. I mean, you just, I assume you probably saw that Tom Cruise deep fake from a couple of months ago, or it's like totally convincingly Tom Cruise. I think, are you talking about the Corridor Digital one? I can't remember. Probably. I, th- I think you probably are because those guys have been really pushing the envelope in terms of the, like small small studio deepfakes. It, it's scary. Yeah. And at some yeah. point, it's like, do you just license the likeness from the actor and just have yeah. an impersonator much cheaper do the performance or yeah. just completely CG? Like what, yeah. where does the, that's going to be an interesting development legally. It, like, the the law is going to need to do too. a lot. I yeah. think so too. That, so that's yeah. kind of just, yeah, that's where I'm kind of fascinated is how, how close can we get to the facsimile or the, the emulation of the, of the stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, there was also, there's a film coming out either this year or next where they've cast James Dean as the, as the lead, which is like, wow. why? Why? Also, there are plenty of living actors that need work and are great. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. But I have a question, actually. Like, um, since I... I want to know more about intellectual property, copyright. Where can I start? Like, do you have any recommendations, like reading um, for beginners? Yeah, this might not be the sexiest answer, but actually uh, copyright.gov, which is the the website (laughs) for the United States Copyright Office. There's a whole ton of, like, you know, um, intro to like, what is copyright law? What is fair use? How does it work? Okay. (laughs) Um, They're actually quite friendly and accessible and thorough. Code of Best Practices for uh, uh, for Fair Use in Visual Art. That is okay. the document that I mentioned earlier that the College Art Association put out, which is a, a, a it's about a 20 page PDF that's targeted specifically to people working in the art sector, artists, Perfect. art historians, curators. Um, that's another great just little primer. Great question, Nate. I'm so glad we got a chance to talk. I really enjoyed Likewise. getting to know you, and I'm Likewise. glad you joined us. And uh, okay. maybe at some point we can have you back on again. Um, Happy to do it. Let's keep in touch. I enjoyed this. Definitely. Cool. cool. All right. Well, I'm going to stop the recording there. <laughs> okay. So Izzy's having some technical difficulties and she's, uh, her, her headphones have died. So Izzy's already saying goodbye because she has no idea what's happening. Her headphones are still, are still dead. Uh, 
That's it for this episode of the Value Art Podcast, guys. Thank you again for joining. By the time this episode airs, the auction will have already ended for the for Banksy spike. Uh, I can't wait to discuss it. I can't wait to see. So uh, as always, if you want to reach out to us and give us some feedback or c- communicate with us directly, you can reach us on our subreddit, Twitter, and Instagram on all of our social channels. Uh, yeah, so that's it. So from me and on behalf of Izzy, who cannot communicate, Thank you for joining us this week, and we'll see you next week. Ciao. Say bye, Izzy. Wait, bye. <laughs> okay, bye. <laughs> uh.